Well, we are nearing the end. Now, for those of you who are new, just so I'm not throwing everyone off, we've been reading as a congregation from the story, and many of us know this. We've been reading right along a chapter a week. There's 31 chapters in here, and the story is really an abridged version of the Holy Scriptures read in chronological order. It's really quite a nice read. And we're in the 30, 30th chapter of 31 chapters. Whew. So we're near the end. Listen now for the word of the Lord from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he, has, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Indeed, it is the word of the Lord, and as I look over this passage, we could do multiple Sundays breaking it apart, but we're going to focus on a few items. But in order to do so, it's important to keep in mind context. That is, what was the reality in which it's written, what it was the reality in which it was heard, and even today, what's the reality in which we hear it. To hear something exciting and positive when you're down and discouraged might be helpful, but it also might come at the wrong time. Whereas to hear something that's discouraging when you're all excited and joyful also doesn't seem to fit. We need to know why it was written, to whom it was written, as well as how it relates to our own life. You see, here we're reading this word over this 4th of July weekend. My family, we went on Friday, we went to the air show over in Battle Creek. Anybody been to that thus far this year? That's uh, loud, okay? But I went... And I was certainly just enjoyed thoroughly. I went to see the F-22 Raptor. I'm not speaking Greek at this moment. It's one of our newest fighter planes. And I was not disappointed. That thing was amazing. Powerful. And they seemed to every test they had to, as it turned away from us, to turn on the thrusters so we could hear the... Did that come over the microphone okay? An amazing sight, the power of that plane. And then what really moved everyone there, what made everyone stand up in the crowd out of their chairs, was when the F-22 Raptor circled slowly with a P-51 Mustang from World War II. The imagery was impressive. An imagery of overcoming Tremendous difficulties, an imagery of power and strength, and an imagery of what's been handed down. You know, I couldn't help but think about the dichotomy that was presented at the same time. When I think about Independence Day and what we're celebrating, you see, when George Washington was leading those who would follow when he was commissioned by the, that Continental Congress, when, when all that was taking place, life was not easy. Those of us who've leafed through the pages of history know the incredible struggle and strain that General Washington was under. He was writing countless letters 
back to Congress. I mean, he was trying to fight a war with the most powerful empire known on the globe. And he was trying to do so without money, without resources, with men who were untrained, often dealing with a militia that when they would stand there ready to fight for their own homeland, would turn and run the moment the British actually showed up. And dealing with conscripts, those who had signed on to be in the Continental Army for a set period of time. I was sharing with my children how we can be proud that Captain Bailey, one of our ancestors, served right under General Washington. And one of the reasons we know that is because we have his letter to General Washington asking to be relieved of duty so he could go back and attend to his farm. The difficulties, the strain in which this country was born are enormous. It was not all glory. It was dark. It was dismal. It was valley forged and frozen feet. It was countless losses. The crossing of the Delaware was a tremendously brave and risky operation. Going over to Trenton, an enormous challenge. We're born as a country through a very dark and dismal, oppressive time. Why do I go through all that background? To set some of the context of what Paul was facing when he wrote this letter to, to Timothy, this second letter of Timothy. You see, though we are near the end of the story, it really parallels where they were in the early church, it was a very dark time. They had had success. They had traveled around. Paul himself had planted many a church. But now, following what we usually understand as his fourth missionary journey, Paul is once again in jail. But this time, it's not jail as he's had it before. It's not house arrest like he had previously in Rome. This time, he's under arrest, and he is truly in jail. Shackled. Matter of fact, what we're told, what Paul himself tells us, is that most of his fellow followers have fallen away. They've run from the situation. Only Onephorus he praises. Onephorus came to Rome trying to find Paul, and he had to search for him before he finally found him to bring him comfort so buried within the prison system. It was a dark time. The church was clamping down. You remember, of all the emperors you learn about other than Caesar, you've learned about Nero. It was the time of Nero. It was a dark and oppressive time. And Paul, on the inside of those bars, had to be wondering not just how is the church doing, but how are his fellow leaders in the faith doing? Many times as a church, we journey through these letters that are written to other churches. But now we have a moment to read into that inner dialogue that took place between leadership. When Paul writes to one of his fellow leaders, Timothy, who as Herb explained to us, was one who was raised up in the Jewish faith and came to believe in Christ. And Paul took and personally tutored, refers to him more than once as his own son, the one in whom he could truly trust. Remember when we read about Thessalonians, the Thessalonica last week? Timothy was the one who was sent to them to check on them because Timothy was the one person Paul knew he could trust. And now in this dark moment, Paul is worried even about Timothy as people fall away. This is where the church is. And this is why the word hangs so heavily that Paul uses about being ashamed. He writes, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of me, though I'm in prison. Ashamed. Ashamed. We know what the word means. We use it. We feel it. But think about the overall sense of what it is. It's not wanting to be associated with or feeling guilty about what we've done or not wanting to be part of what someone else is. 
Ashamed has a sense in which we differentiate, in which we may say, yeah, that person's family, but I don't agree with what they've done. We set up some kind of boundary between us, making sure that people don't lump us together. Ashamed is an effort, no matter how strong the ties are, to put some kind of distance between us. Paul is feeling that distance. He's feeling the distance of those who have abandoned the work. He's feeling the distance of those who've run because they know that to be associated with Paul is a risk that they themselves will be arrested. This is the time. Imagine today if the law went out that to be a Christian wasn't just to be frowned upon, but to be a Christian meant that you were to definitely go under possible arrest and all that you have all that you are is going to be combed through all your records all your emails all your finances everything is going to be checked out to make sure it's just right Paul is worried about Timothy Paul also recognizes the circumstances he's in where other times he was optimistic that he would be freed when he was optimistic that he'd be able to go on and spread the gospel, Paul recognizes that his time is now coming. And so he's doing what any of us might do. He's sorting through all of his life. He's sorting through everything that is of value to him. And he's trying to determine what to hand on. You know, I see this happen over and over again in our families. When someone is older and starts... Uh, paring down, they start determining what parts, what items in the family will go to whom, right? You've been part of that as well. Imagine, though, for yourself, what it would be like to not only stuff, but to think about, okay, what do I really want my family to know? What do I want to deposit within my family that they carry on? What have I been given that I want to be passed on? This hits us as second reformed right between the eyes. What? What if you were given a chance to write a letter right now to your family? What would you want them to know most importantly over everything else? What would you share what would come from the deepest part of your heart? That's where Paul is. That's where Second Timothy comes from. And so he's telling Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't place separation between yourself and the gospel. Don't differentiate yourself on any level from the message that we are carrying. And that's the important part. He wants to lift up again the message of Jesus Christ. The good news is what we call it. We call it gospel, but you know that that means good news. Think about it. We're saying, above all other news, this is really good news. This is what matters. This is what I want you to catch and hold on to. And Paul summarizes the message very simply. He says that God through Christ abolished death. Death. That which we most fear. Ironically, that which has led many people to leave Paul and to run flee. The very thing that they flee in fear of is the very thing that God through Jesus Christ has abolished. Death will not hold a permanent place in the lives of those who follow Jesus Christ. And then the second part of that, not only has he abolished Christ, abolished death, but secondly, that through him he has brought life and immortality, life eternal. This is Paul's message. 
This is what Paul wants to remind Timothy. Timothy, who's not just some mild believer. This is someone who he deeply has entrusted his life's work to before. And now he's making sure that as he passes on the baton, he's making sure he's clear. Look at Death is done and life has come. That is the message. And it's all through Jesus Christ. And everyone needs to know it. Don't be ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that, even though I'm in prison, even though everyone would run from me, even though everything about me suggests that you don't want to go down that path. Don't be ashamed. Don't put any separation in there. And then he gives them two points of direction. He says to follow the pattern. Follow the pattern of the words that I have given you. Follow the pattern of God's word. Follow the pattern of what's been given you and continue to pass that on. Follow the pattern. You know, each of us have different patterns in our life. Some that we've taught, we've gone through rhythmically with people, trying to help them to learn how to do. When you teach piano, for example, you go through certain patterns of fingering, right? Teach sports certain patterns. Teaching itself is pattern working. And then there's also those patterns that we do that we don't even know we're teaching. Do you realize my parents gave me some patterns? I try to shake some of them, but I can't. They're deeply in there. Every now and then you will catch me saying at nighttime, when you contact me on the phone, you'll catch me say, good morning. My mom does that. My mom, no matter what time of day it is, says, good morning. We used to tease her about it, and she couldn't stop doing it. She says, good morning. Now, no doubt that was passed on to her. Now, my mom is a night owl. She'll stay up late into the night, and then in the morning, she's really not quite with it for a while. But still, she answers the phone and says, good morning. And I think that's because somewhere deep within her is this belief that every moment's a new moment. No matter what anxiety might grab her or us or any of us, she's still looking for that new moment, that new chance. Paul is saying to Timothy, follow the pattern. Follow the pattern of what's been given to you. Follow the pattern of the words that I have spoken to you. Follow the pattern of God's word. We can't follow the pattern unless we're in God's word. We can't follow the pattern unless we put ourselves in a place to repetitively hear the pattern. It doesn't just fall out of, out of nowhere. The patterns take time. We need to be taught them. And we need to put ourselves in a position such as now to hear the pattern. Remember, Paul summarizes it. Death has been abolished. And through him, life has been brought in. Life eternal. Life immortal. Follow the pattern. What's the other thing he says? Did you catch it? By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Deposit. That which has been poured into you. That which you've been asked to carry, to hold on to. You know, I've been up here many a time doing a marriage ceremony, right? And here I am, and I get to that point with the groom, and I say, and what do you give as a sign of this promise? And he says, a ring. And I look to him for the ring, of course. And he turns to the best man, and what happens? Well, you always got that comical best man who starts pulling out the pockets everywhere. But usually, they have the ring. They're the best man. They have been entrusted with the ring. They've got one job. One job only. And that job is ring. 
And yet it has happened that there is a best man who stands up here and it's not a joke. Where's the ring? I I forgot it on the nightstand. And we all laugh. The Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, look, this has been handed on to you. It is God-ordained. You have been called out when the difficulty was that you couldn't even go to synagogue to be trained as a religious rabbi because of your Greek heritage. Your grandmother and your mother took it into their own hands. Thank God for the women of the church. It has been deposited in you. Hold on to that deposit. Because that deposit is not just for you to hold on to, but to give out to the next person, to pass it on. These are Timothy's, excuse me, Paul's last words this letter, and he's trying to be clear about how we're going to keep it going. And he realizes that the faith is alive only so long as the next generation carries it. And when the next generation looks like they may not carry it, whose responsibility is that? Ours. To remind them, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was important what I just gave you. That's more important than anything else you're playing with right now. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Careful with that. That's the China. Yeah, I know it's the China. No, 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 that doesn't go in the dishwasher. Oh, why not? I just want to be done. What? No, 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 that chi- that's China. That doesn't go through the dishwasher. It'll get ruined. Why well, can't it go in the dishwasher? Because it's going to get ruined. What's the matter anyway? Uh, that China is not my mother's China. That is my grandmother's China which means that's your great-grandmother's China. And I know you don't know her, but she held you when you were born. And there was not a more cherished moment in her life with a smile on her face when she held you and you now want to stick that love in the dishwasher. (laughs) Fine, I'll wash it. It is our responsibility to pass on what Paul passed on to Timothy, what Timothy passed on to others, what others passed on to them. And you and I are here today, not because we came to it out of nowhere, but because it was passed on to us, and we have the responsibility for people to understand those who we play with. That this deposit is the greatest news ever given. Handle it with care. Recognize I have nothing more important than this to give you. Don't put any separation between it and yourself. Do not be ashamed. Let us pray.